Hey, this is Joe Cords from Comax Properties. If you want to learn how to use your small axe to build an empire, you should be listening to the Small Axe Podcast with my good friend, Nico. Hey guys, it's your boy Nico here from the Small Axe Podcast. I want to show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. You see, not everybody begins their investing career with millions of dollars, a huge network of investors, or the knowledge necessary to become successful in this space. And that's okay. What I focus on here on this podcast is helping you hone your skills, sharpen your tools to become the best investor that you can be. Now, I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this show. If you have any questions or you want to reach out to me or the guest, feel free to do so. Love you guys. All right. Okay, Small Axe community. It is Nico, your boy, and I'm here today hanging out with a good friend of mine. His name is Joe Cords. We met a couple years ago, ago now, and I'm, I'm uh, really excited to have him on as a guest because he's got an extensive background. He's got a lot of knowledge and he's crushing the game today. So it's without further ado, I'm going to get him on and have him introduce himself. Joe, what's up, man? Hey, Nico. How you doing, buddy? Good, man. I'm excited to have you. Can you, so I know about you, but can you kind of take the listeners on a journey of how you got to where you are today? Uh, yeah, sure. So I am from uh, Queens, grew up in Queens, um, and I was for many years in law enforcement. I was at NYPD for 23 years, went out of there straight out of college. Um, uh, but that being said, I got in real estate when I was about 23. I bought my first two family house, me and my brother. At the time, we were living home and we were making a lot of overtime and working a lot. And I saved up a bunch of money. My father had bought a two family house. He had a friend who owned a bunch of fourplexes and kind of got him interested in real estate. And so me and my brother jumped in, bought a two family house in Rockaway, Queens that we had for about 20 years. Um, and then my plan was always kind of to get, get into real estate, even though I was in law enforcement and kind of moved up the ranks and continued to go to school and spend a lot of time kind of in education and, and um, promotional exams in the police department. But I always kind of had real estate on the back burner, you know, um, but I went about I went about, I'm going to say 20 years before I bought my second home. I bought the first uh, investment property at 23. Um, I left the police department in uh, after 23 years. I uh, wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I took a job with a solar energy company where we actually have a mutual friend um, as the fifth employee as a sales guy. Uh, oddly offered the job from a, a guy who had a solar system put on my house. And I uh, kind of didn't want to stay in law enforcement, security, that whole world. I loved it for years, but I just always had like a business entrepreneur kind of spirit in myself. And I kind of, even the police department, I sold used cars for a while as a sideline. I always had something going. Um, so anyway, that was pivotal kind of in my shift of direction because I kind of learned about small business. I grew with the business by the time I left three years later, the company had grown 18 people. I was realized I had some skill maybe at, at the game and certainly sales uh, sold about 140 electric systems during the recession um, and got better at it and availed myself of every bit of sales training I could get. And I kind of liked it. I left that company and went to another company kind of in the corporate security field um, in New York city. I'd never worked there before. I took the training like people do. I uh, hated it from like the second week I started to plan how I was going to get out of there. And after about two and a half years, I got out of there and decided I'm never working for anybody else. I was full-time into real estate. And that was about 10 years ago um, because a guy has been working for me for 10 years. We mud up just as I bought my second two-family house. He worked with me for about 10 years and, and he moved to New Jersey now. So I kind of, yesterday was a big day for me because it was kind of, when I got started flipping and, and doing houses, you know, I, I started working with this guy. Um, and then maybe about, I started, I got a two-family house, did a ton of work. Started to get some rental income. I liked it, but I kind of realized, like, if I keep doing this, I, I'd have to be 150 years old to be by the time I made any real money, you know, buying a every seven or eight years, buying a two family house. So I started flipping houses. I flipped about 60 houses in the last, say, six or seven years here in Long Island. That was good. 
Um, and then maybe about four years ago, I started to realize like, I'm getting a little long in the tooth here, as they say. Um, and, and I got to start getting involved in some things that are going to carry me as I get older. So I started, um, I started, you know, like a carpenter, you know, sees every, every what nail, you know, and he's a hammer, right? He only sees it that way. Mm -hmm. I kind of was as a flipper. I saw everything as something I could flip and get a big cash and, you know, uh, windfall, which is, it's almost like being a little bit of an addict. You get these big numbers, you know, it's six, six months and then boom, you get a big payday, you know, and it's a little intoxicating. But I kind of started to realize, I started to look at properties differently. If thought, someone could be like a rental or something, I wasn't even looking at that. I passed up on deals for years that would probably be great rentals right now that have for years. But I just saw myself as a flipper, which is a big, big mistake. So I bought a house out in Jamesport. Uh, it was a, would have been the second investment property I bought. And um, I, could, I knew I couldn't flip it with the numbers, but I knew it would make a great vacation rental. So I bought that uh, in 2019. I still have it. It's a big, beautiful 3,400 square foot house. We do some VRBO and Airbnb rentals and, and it's a great asset. It's probably doubled in value. And um, I kind of started getting, realizing I got to start pulling in some rental properties here. Uh, and then I started picking them up. I picked up uh, another two family that I'm renting. Then I bought a house that I was going to flip and I ended up converting it into an eight bedroom student rental over at Hofstra University. So I got in a student rental business, which I'm in much more now in other states as well. I had a vacation rental and I had two, two family. I picked up another single family. I just picked up now another two family. And now these things are starting to stack up and I'm starting to get kind of income where I'm kind of letting the flipping business go now because I don't need it to carry me on my day to day now. You know, I make enough money um, from my from my rental properties. Um without having to do that, which is a good time. It's not a great time to be flipping houses anyway. Um, so the, like the five-year-old Joe is happy with himself. You know, five years ago, I'd say good job on that because if I hadn't been that way, I'd be tied to kind of flipping houses now just for income. Um, and then when maybe about two years ago, probably when I met you, I got an MIH, uh, mastermind group for multifamily. I've always been interested. And um I started getting involved with some partners and now just closed on a 17 unit uh, up in um, Scranton. Um, I have about 200 units as a GP in Raleigh, uh, Georgetown, Somerville, um, uh, South Carolina, and North Carolina. And I have some student rentals over at the University of South Carolina. I actually was just on the phone with the management company before we got on this call. I have a duplex and a triplex down there. Um, own a 15 unit, build the rent up in Boone. So been a busy, really busy couple of years here. Um, as you know, also, I do some hard money lending, which I have been doing even when I was flipping was another good line of business that I got in through, into um, and I've done some wholesaling. So flipping, wholesaling, some smaller uh, two families and and one out up here in Long Island, some multifamily out of state, um, and uh, vacation rental, all of which I would do more of, uh, depending. And the main point, I guess, of all of this long history is I now see a deal as a deal, right? How can I make money from it? And I'd heard that for years from mentors and books and everything. Like you got, oh, can I do this? Where I only had one speed. You kind of have to be open to everything. And I've kind of definitely figured that out. I also have, have a land development deal out in East Hampton um, that years ago I would have passed on because as I would have looked at it as a flip and realized I couldn't make any money on it. Um, but I can subdivide it and I'm along in that process now. So I'll be able to develop about an acre behind it um, and then still have the front as a rental, which I'm renting now. Yo, oh, man, this is incredible. You, you're your background is freaking wild, man. Oh, thanks. You a lot. Like, how do you, I'm sure, I'm sure your every single day is just jam packed because how do you even task all this out? Is it all in your head? I mean, how do you get like, how do you know when you wake up in the morning, you you're getting to work, I'm assuming. Yeah. Well, I'm up early. Um, that's kind of the secret weapon for me and really anybody is to be up and early and at it. Um, and yeah, you know, it was almost, almost too much of it was in my head. 
you know. Um, so I have worked longer than I wanted to at times, you know, but it's it's just a different thing as it, you know, when you work for yourself, you know, it doesn't hurt as much. You know, I was always a workhorse in the police department. Any job I ever had, I was the guy that people wanted to work for them. Oh, I want to get that guy, you know, because because he's a I was always just that guy from when I was a kid. Um, so I didn't mind it and I mind it less because it's my own kind of business I'm building now, you know, but there does get a point where you want to have some more quality of life, you know? Um, but for me, you know, kind of always going in these different directions, you know, um, has, has really, really been key. Um, and, and I will tell you now, like the, 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 the thing about house flipping, that's a grind, you know? I just had a year because I was I had a house out in East Hampton two and a half two hours from where I live, and I had to do a hundred thousand dollar renovation out on that and get it rented, and then I did a hundred uh, about a hundred thousand. I have a split level two family, and I, I did a hundred thousand dollar renovation on one side and got it rented up, and then was going to cruise for a while, and then like a month later, my tenant died on the other side. Oh my god! Rack. So oh. in the summer, I had to roll into like another hundred thousand dollar renovation. Not that I'm doing the work, but you know. You know, managing contractors and subs and permitting and uh, pulling materials and whatever. It's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work and it never ends, you know. Were you ever hands-on during the flipping business? Oh, yeah. In the beginning, um, I was probably 75% on, 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 you know. And that's not necessarily because I wanted to be, you know. Um, early on, I didn't buy good enough deals. So the numbers were tight, right? Because I hadn't really... I was getting them from realtors. You know, eventually I started to do all my own marketing, right? And then I started to get the deals that had fatter margins. And then I could take on contractors taking bigger, bigger pieces. But I mean, my first flip, I probably spent 75% uh, doing doing work there. I had some contract to help. And I remember when I, um, the realtor called me that it was sold. And I knew the numbers so much in my head because I owned every bit of that thing. You know, my whole, like, I'm like, I'm not working for anybody. I've worked for people my whole life. This was like my first business venture. You know, I had a wife and two young kids. Like, it, you know, there's a lot of pressure, you know, to to do that. And um, I remember getting a call. I was standing in my garage. I still remember it, you know. Uh, and the guy was like, I did the math in my head. I'm like, I'm going to make 32 grand on this flip. And That's like, right. I wouldn't do a flip now for 32 grand, you know. And well, even well, yeah, but let's talk about that. Why not? Because it's not enough. It's not like you'd almost better off having a job, you know, because like it's just the moving parts and it really from a return because I had a lot of money tied up in it, my own money, you know, and if you looked at it and you really did the rate of return, it wasn't awesome. But psychologically, it was amazing because it's the first time I created something right out of not having a W-2 job. You know, I'd done little things like the car sales and little side hustles I had. But like, this is the first time I was like, oh, I can go out there and just on my own, negotiate a deal, you know, find a property, negotiate a deal. You know, I'd rent a lobby, so I knew that worked. But, and then flipped it and made like 32 grand. You know, I'd never done that before. So that on top of hadn't worked at two separate companies where I helped build the business, I knew that, you know, uh, when I was a VP, so I was responsible for everything. And I grew that business from two people to about 19 by the time I left. And in the solar company too, not that I built that business alone, but a lot of it was, I was a sales guy. I was the only sales guy for like two years. So a lot of that business was built on my, so I kind of started to right, build up all this confidence. Like I'm an ex-cop. Like, I remember when a guy went to hire me as a sales guy, I'm like, I'm not a salesman, you know, mm -hmm. not that I diminished my ability, but he's like, no, you, you know how to speak to people. You know, mm -hmm. and he saw, I guess he saw something in me. Um, you do. And that, that really does translate to your, your marketing business and your, your cold calling business. And I want to get there in a second, but just for our listeners purposes on the, on the, let's say you earn 32 K there are tax implications on a flip, which are a little different than other investments. Was that, is that the same for you being retired? Uh, yeah, well, it's a new business, right? So it's it's tax like whatever tax bracket I'm in on a flip, you know. Mm. Um, it was, it's, it's taxable income or whatever whatever bracket I was in that year, right? And I had self employment tax too because I was self employed, mm. you know. Um, so the game is now the last couple of years, my tax implications have been negligible because I got in the multifamily space and I started getting involved in bigger assets. 
mm -hmm. and uh, doing cost, segrega uh, cost segregation studies and uh, bonus depreciation. And I was able to offset a lot of my income uh, the last few years because I got in the rental business. Like, had I known that earlier, you know, uh, I was paying huge tax bills on the, on these these flips, you know. Um, I mean, I had some rentals as I started to build the rentals up. Obviously, the ongoing depreciation and whatnot helps. Um, but now, now I kind of understand it. Like, I kept a lot more money the last couple of years. Um, you know, self employment tax certainly up here in New York State is hard to get get out of. Um, and the state doesn't treat you as well as some other states on on. Um, but from the federal government standpoint. I'm, I'm where I need to be now with my understanding of that and, and what I will do, you know, moving gotcha. forward. Bye. Gotcha, gotcha. I want to also talk, uh, Joe, a little bit about how, like how many, so, so you go direct to seller now. You've been doing this for a while. I actually took a lot of tips and advice from you. I utilized you on certain occasions here mm -hmm. on Long Island. Maybe you can kind of talk a little bit about how you built that uh, part up and whether or not that's feasible for a regular person to just kind of do it as well. I know you do have now that those that skill set of being kind of a salesman. Uh, talk a little bit about that business. Uh, yeah. So what happened was, you know, the, the the key to this, like they always say, buy right, right. That's the number one thing. You know, um, you got to buy these. You know, I uh, I was a house flipper. I had I had to flip houses to make money, right? And those people are in a tough spot now, right? Someone who has crews and everything. I kind of ran lean and mean. I GC'd a lot of my stuff. I brought a lot of subs in. So I wasn't carrying any overhead, you know, but once I, but I also needed to make money, you know, so I had to flip houses. So I would see these spreads. I bought a house, the one that is a student rental for me. I paid two ninety for it uh, three, four years ago over by Hofstra. It was Cape. It was, I mean, I did $200,000 renovation. Went up and out the back and two hundred twenty thousand dollars renovation on. I see at the closing, I bought it from a wholesaler here in Long Island. He's a pretty good guy, and he paid two hundred for it, and I paid two ninety for it, right? And I remember my attorney saying, "You see what he paid for it," and I remember being like, "I don't care. It doesn't matter, right?" That you should never get mad at, right? That he paid two hundred. He could have paid a hundred for it. At two ninety, that was a deal, you know. Like you got to lose your ego too. Right. You got to just be like a deal machine. Is this a deal or not? I don't have to like this seller or all this other stuff that could invade your, your thoughts. So but then I was like, darn, 90 grand. That's that's good. Right. And then that's when I kind of started getting more serious. Also, what happens is wholesale is like, oh, they were trying to bring you up. Like you never get the deal at a really sweet spot. So I started really getting interested. In, and what I would tell you, and you know this. I've been in multiple mastermind groups, you know, that, that was key. And I would be around other investors and, um, and I had a network. New York's tough to operate, you know, and when I started out here, nobody would tell you anything. So I started joining these mastermind groups and I joined one out in California uh, and flew out there and, and um, met a bunch of people. And I kind of started understanding the business and you got to do your own marketing if you want to get the best deals. Right. And I still remember what the guy used to say that used to run our mastermind group. You go, stop worrying about what marketing costs you. If I told you how to machine it, every time you put a dollar into it, it would give you $2. Why wouldn't you do that, right? So that's always the theory, you know, like it doesn't matter what it costs. What's the return, you know? So if I spent 5,000 on marketing, you know, I spent um, on this last deal that I, I got, I probably spent about $4,000 on marketing and I bought a house for 470. Then now I have about, 250 in it, it appraised at 975, right? And it cash flows $1,700 a month. I mean, on four grand, right? Wow. That was on a direct mail piece that I sent a year and a half before I bought it, right? And the woman's daughter, the woman was elderly and her daughter had it. And her daughter, when, when mom was ready to move down to Florida, she liked my mail piece. It was very straightforward. She saw my Google reviews, which are very good. I was the first person she called. I made a deal with her. I bought the house, right? Awesome. So, uh, you know, that's just another aside on marketing, right? Text, uh, sometimes cold calling, they have no kind of legacy. Direct mail, I'm a big fan of because direct mail, that sometimes goes in the drawer, you know, and then it, and it's a comeback, you know, and I've gotten some a few really, really good deals. So 
the long and short of it is like if you want to control your deal flow, um, you have to you have to do direct to seller marketing, right? You can't depend on other people. And then number two, just from another standpoint, I've learned direct mail, as they always say, is scalable. So you should be able to figure out once you start to get some deal flow or talking to other people in your market, if I send this much mail, right, it should result in this money deals. And over time, it actually does work out that way. If you're doing it the right way, you're consistent about your marketing, you're answering the phone when it rings on the first ring, right? And you're having good conversations and you're making offers, you could scale that up. So if I'm getting four deals from 10,000 in marketing, you know, I should be able to go, you know, uh, to 20,000 in marketing and get eight deals, you know? Let, let me let me ask you a question. When you're when you send out the mailers, I'm sure you can you have a program or some or something that you use to do it. But when you send out the mailers, there's got to be some sort of database or something because when somebody calls you, they are they they probably give you an address, and I'm sure you pull up something really quick to know what it's valued more or less, right? So you can kind of talk to them real time. Yeah. So like some of and you're right. That's you know you kind of learn some of the stuff as you go along. So I I've used a, a variety of systems. Um, I've used a separate CRM uh, to track calls and you can use various tools like call rail I've used for years. People will call, right? You could set up multiple numbers and it'll push to your phone and then you can tag those numbers, right? So if I mailed to a probate list or I mailed to a um, tax delinquent list, that'll be a different number and it'll come up on my phone. I'll say tax delinquent or right or probate. Because if I'm answering a probate call, I'm going to answer it in a Listen, you always got to answer the phone and treat anybody with, with kindness, right? Because they're under stress, so they wouldn't be calling you. But I want to know if somebody died in the family, right, before I'm answering in that call. And then sometimes mm -hmm. I'll say, oh, I sent you a letter, right? And they believe sometimes that you, you send out just a handful of these things, right? And you can know who they are. Um, and so sometimes I'll be like, I'm sorry, what town are you in? And they'll say, I'll say, oh, yeah, I mailed like 100 in that town. What was your address again? And you're right, if I'm sitting on my computer, I used to pull it up, right, very quickly and see what the deal is with it. So you want to have a CRM then so that you can then, you know, uh, pull it up right away and, and, and see what's going on with the property. And then you want to have some type of system where you can schedule your marketing. That is what gets most people. If you don't have your marketing scheduled, you will be intermittent with it and you will not send it out like clockwork. There's better and better systems, right? There's a lot of people selling a lot of different programs, which will, will tie a, a, a CRM um, so you can manage all your lead intake and it'll tie it to then the ability to skip trace and find out people's phone numbers, pull lists. I'm looking at one now I may switch to where you can do all of that and then mail out of it and email out of it and text out of it and then pull in your phone and it kind of does everything. You know, these get these these systems are like used to be podio. We started about like 10 years ago, yeah. building a podio, and you got to get a podio guy and he's got to build the thing for you. And it was just it's and podio is really not CRM management, you know, it wasn't designed for that. It was um the construction management is really what started with. But now yeah. there's a lot of vendors, and for a hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred dollars a month, you can have a system that you could basically do it all from. Um, so it became it becomes much easier if you're on a small budget. You get a system like that. You could buy these packages where it will send, you know, uh, a piece of mail every month or every other month or every three months, but it'll also intermix two emails and two texts, right? And and it'll kind of, you know, that you're touching them, you know? Another big key about that is people respond to different types of, of mediums, right? So older people, well, I'll put myself in that category, <laughs> mail, right? Yeah. I come home, I stick my hand in that mailbox every day. I go by my kitchen counter. I go through it. I look at it. I just rip it in half when I'm done processing it. All the junk mail I put in the garbage, right? And then the other mail bills go over here and this goes over here. That's how I was trained. My brothers mm -hmm. do that. My parents do that. My friends do that. Yep. You know, so those people respond to mail. They'll respond to, they won't respond to a text. Do you want to sell your house, right? Got to right. be careful with texting too now. A lot of a lot of federal laws and do not call this. You can get yourself in trouble. Cold calling, they don't know you, they block you. You know, um, maybe people don't go online and search. 
I've gotten a lot of houses from my website where people are searching and I come up, you know, and they like the people respond to Google search. So can I look at the reviews? But for me, a lot of my success has been direct mail. And then I have a bunch of really good re Google reviews that are legit. And people who look at mail will then search you, see if you're in a better business bureau, which is an old person thing. Mm. Uh, and I pay every year to have it. Um, and then they check your Google reviews. And if you're, you know, if you're the only one mailing them or you're the only one who they can then go look and see your Google reviews, that's the first call they're going to make, you cool. know? Cool. So, awesome advice, Joe. Um, yeah. So let's say, let's say, have you been able to get any like larger multifamily family deals through uh, any of these mediums? No, but I'm going to. <laughs> so what I've been doing now is kind of transitioning a house flipping and um, starting with the new year, we're going to do a direct to seller campaign as it's called within multifamily. These same databases like uh, list source, it's a bunch of resources, prop stream, a lot of providers for this data. You could search multifamily as well. Uh, Cause it's, it's, it's really scraping County records for the most part. So um, the big, big stuff you might not be able to find. But certainly like less than 100 units, you can pull up in these um, programs and then you can, it's basically the same thing, uh, except you might have more corporations. So then you got to try to skip trace corporations to figure out who's who, um, which can be done. A mm -hmm. lot of skip tracing, if you pay extra, they'll go to the next level, try to see, you know, who, who you're going to mail to. Um, and the same thing, you, you, you could call them, you could text them, you could try to reach them on you know, an email campaign. Um, you can hang, you know, find out where they live and hang door hangers. I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do, but I'm planning with some partners of mine and we're going to do some of that in in uh, in PA and down in the Carolinas. Cool, man. I love it. Now, uh, for, for those listening out there, you got into some bigger deals. Um, is the work involved more, less, or just different? Um. It's probably less for me. It's been more just because we've, with some partners, we picked up some troublesome assets, you know, that require more work than they should have, that we're still trying to get straightened out. Um, it is definitely different. It is, it is definitely, it's, a, you know, some of these same tools can be used, right? Networking, relationships. There's a certain loss of control, which for someone like me, I have to embrace, right? If I want to deal in bigger deals. I've been, you know, on effectively a small shop, you know, like you said, I had it all in my head. And now you have to, you have to build good relationships with good partners. And then you have to trust that they're going to do, you know, do their part, you know, and, um, you know, for me, that's, that's a stretch. It hasn't stopped me from, from moving ahead. And I've gotten some really good deals that I wouldn't be in right now. And I've learned a lot. And I've learned a lot from those partners who are more focused on multifamily right? And have dealt with property management across, you know, hundreds and thousands of units. That's all new to me. You know, I spoke to a property manager today, probably third conversation I've ever had with a property manager, you know? Mm. Um, so to me, I'm always trying to learn, you know, I'm always on to the next thing. So I want to grow within this space now, just like as I kind of grew, grew up through the last 10 years, you know, at, as a businessman you know, um, and, and out of kind of law enforcement working for other people, you know. That's awesome, man. I see you as the kind of guy that is uh, going to run an empire at some point. Do you well, have, do you have target markets that you're looking at? I know you, you already mentioned some, but do you like with your new campaign? I think you know, the new campaign we're going to start in PA. Um, you know, Robert Musso, who we know, uh, is a real sharp investor. He's been investing there for about 15 years. You know, boots on the ground. He lives right across the border in Jersey. He's an hour out of the market, um, which which is key. Um, in the Carolinas, one of my partners is you know an hour out of out of the market where we have a bunch of housing down there. So that's definitely a key component because it is difficult to manage these if you do not have somebody there that you can have be on site. Um, yeah, you know uh, that that is definitely key. I probably wouldn't be in that market. You have to obviously, and you've probably heard this many times, and you know it because you do it. Um, if there is no good property management down there, uh, you probably shouldn't be investing down there, especially yeah. if you don't have somebody 
who's well experienced and on and on top of it. Um, you know, I was an LP in a deal in Georgia who I actually got involved in with one of my former mentors. And, you know, what happened with the market and interest rates and and um, uh, refinancing, a whole deal fell apart down there. Now, they're an honorable group. It's a small group. And there weren't a tremendous amount of investors. Um, but it got in trouble. And they could have done a capital call. And, and the guys who sponsored the deal actually stepped up and put their own money into it. And they have a lot of money into it. Wow. And, and the, the deal got in trouble. And ultimately, I'll be in that deal about five years and we'll break even, right? Which right now, mm -hmm. not too bad from things that we're hearing multi-family world, right? Yep. yep. People have dump money into these things, people now losing their money. So I'm okay with that. You know, uh, uh, at this point, you know the deal. You're in real estate, you get your hands dirty enough. A draw sometimes is, is okay. So my, my point of all about that is, that deal went south because of property management. For three years, these intelligent, smart investors that I know, no matter what they did, they couldn't turn the asset around because of horrible process. And then they learned that they're in an area that was really no good property managers. Mm. And they got the opportunity to sell it and, and negotiate out a certain deal that allowed the investors to get their money back. They did. But it was, to me, a real wake-up call. I kind of knew that. And then ultimately, that's what happened. The market changed, but with a good property manager, they would have been okay. And so they had a bad property manager in a tough market, and they were dead in the water. And they tried. Great, great advice and great story there. Thanks for sharing that, Joe. Um, all right, we're going to shift gears now. I am going to ask you my final question. I didn't prep you for this question, man. So you better you better have your brain sharp for it. And then we'll get uh, the listeners some form of reaching out and contacting you. All right, Joe, let's imagine it was 100 years from now. You have great grandchildren and they're so happy and they want to write a book about you and your life. What would you want them to title this book? Hmm. I mean, the first word that, that came to my mind would be relentless. Hmm. Uh, I think tend to be relentless uh not everybody loves that <laughs> uh you know in what you deal with but kind of like anything that i'm in i'm always i'm all in you know my wife will joke about it like man when you are on something it's like it's annoying you know what i'm saying <laughs> it's i'm consumed it's all i read about it's what i you know educate myself on it's what i talk about so like from from literally from the day I had a daily newspaper out when I was nine years old, you know, like I made sure I did that job perfect. Every job I had perfect. Like I said, everybody always wanted me to work for them because they're like, that nut will not give up, right? He will not stop, you know, and that gives people comfort and faith, certainly for your bosses. So to me, it's like, man, when I was in the police department, I gave it 110%, you know, the whole time, you know, and then when I didn't feel like I could do that anymore, I left, you know. And then that solar company, you know, I remember now I wasn't a younger guy, you know what I'm saying? Like I was in the police department 23 years by the time I went to a solar company, you know, mm -hmm. I remember the owner coming in one morning and it was five 30 in the morning. He came in at, at eight and he's the first guy there. Cause he's the owner. I've been there since five 30 <laughs> and he walked through the front door and he goes, what are you doing here? I go, what are you doing here? I go, I was here at five 30. I was waiting for you. you know, <laughs> right. But he's like, wow, I've just never seen anybody work like you, you know, like, so once I get something in my head, I guess that's the answer, you know, um, same thing I, I do now with this business and, uh, and now multifamily, it's like, I'm all in. That would maybe be the other title. It's relentless has been used a lot, even in movies and everything. So maybe I like it. Hey, all all in. relentless, either one. I mean, and you're certainly embodying that, man. You are, you're really crushing it. It's inspiring to watch you do all that you do. Thanks, man. Um, all right, Joe, how can people reach out to you? Um, I'm easy to find. Uh, you, you know, you can find me online. Uh, or, you know, I just give my cell phone number, 516-286-1477. I have no problem with people reaching out to me, texting me, calling me. Um, and um, love to talk real estate. Look, can help anybody out. You have any questions about anything I, I spoke about, I'm, I'm glad to talk to people. 
All right. Hey, Small Axe community. I would like to say thank you for listening to another episode of my podcast, where we show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. Now, if you liked what you heard, it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe, leave a five-star rating, and write a review. Also, if you want to get in touch with me, go to my website at smallaxecommunities.com. Book a call with me. And until the next episode, keep sharpening those axes.